So quick history, Alan and I, Alan and I met because uh, with Carbonation 1.0, um, Bill Curtis was the narrator. And when I started wanting to learn more about the grazing, because I knew that this would be my first short film for the whole Carbonation 2.0 series, and that's what this is, I called Bill and said, teach me about the cattle business. And long conversation, I said, who, who can I speak to? And he said, speak to Alan. And so Alan and I have known each other, if I look at my notes, I think it's about two years now yep. on phone one. calls. Mm -hmm. And then we met last June in Starkville, filming the film that you just saw. And, and then I filmed the other uh, Gabe and Neil in August of last year. Um, Alan, let's talk about your, your growth. You, you got your master's from Clemson. You got your PhD from LSU. Correct. And what was your PhD in? And, and then you taught for 15 years, sort of the conventional style, correct? Tell me about that. Well, I, yeah, my PhD is in um, basically livestock genetics and reproductive physiology. Um, and I, I grew up on a family farm in South Carolina. We were a very diversified operation. Um, and really, that had a big impact on the transition that I've made in, in my career and what I'm doing now. But when I went to graduate school and got heavily involved in, uh, in, in research and so forth, I also got heavily involved in the, in the conventional or commodity sector of the ag industry. And for many years, I was sort of wrapped up in, in the way that we were doing things there. But there were some things that I noticed. Uh, yeah, I noticed that we were using a lot more inputs, whether it was with the livestock, whether it was Define with the inputs. Land. Inputs, uh, everything from pharmaceuticals, you know, medications, antibiotics, so on and so forth, uh, even, <laughs> even anthelmintics or dewormers, you know, all of these types of things, parasiticides and so forth for livestock. Uh, in terms of the land inputs, such as inorganic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, you know, all of those things that you typically see in, in, in a commodity or conventional ag operation. And uh, the, the thing that I noticed was that over the years, we were losing net margin. Okay? Our, because of all of those inputs, our costs were rising. And, and so our net margins were going down, down, and down, even though our yields were going up. Whether we're talking about weaning weight or yearling weight in cattle or whether we're talking about crop yields or whatever, they were going up, they were increasing. So we were succeeding in that regard, but at the same time, we were not succeeding financially. And we became very heavily dependent on, on a lot of these inputs. And so after noticing all of these things, and, and I became heavily involved in the feedlot sector, and, uh, and, and I noticed the amount of antibiotics you know, that we were using and, you know, and in the feedlot sector, and it's just the nature of the beast, but uh, you, know, you have pen riders, and, and their uh, function every day is to ride the pens to check for sick cattle and, and so forth. And, and in that typical type of situation, you do have cattle that are sick quite frequently. And, and so growing up on the farm, I said, you know, we didn't have that. Uh, and we rarely had to treat our animals. And the truth is a lot, and that was in the 60s and 70s, and a lot of the inputs that I started using in the 80s and 90s and so forth, we didn't even have when I was growing up. And, and I kept wondering, how did we make it without all of, out all of those inputs then but now I need them. And so in the whole process of that, I was doing consulting. I had clients, ranchers and farmers around the U.S. and in Canada. And, uh, and so I started to notice some of the innovative things that, that some of my clients were doing. And, and now I tell my clients, I really learn more from you than you learn from me. But, but that was a huge benefit to me because I started to see things that, that there were other ways to, to practice some of our management techniques and so forth that would allow us to reduce reliance on inputs, to increase profit margins, and yet have a very healthy ecosystem and to even restore that. Uh, so 
I came back home and I started putting a lot of these practices into place myself. Experimenting. Experimenting. Like no one knows. The, no. Yeah, it's just a brand new world. Uh, right? it, it, I, I assure you, it was pure trial and error. Yeah. And, and even with our clients, and, and you know, over the last 15 years, we've done a lot of this on our own farm and, and on many of our clients' farms and ranches. And it has been lots of trial and error, mm -hmm. uh, just figuring out how to do things. And, and I assure you, we made a lot of mistakes. But here's the deal. If, if you have skin in the game, you know, if your livelihood is dependent on what you're doing on an everyday basis, then your trial and error teaches you an awful lot very quickly. Yeah. Because when you're losing money, you got to figure out how to make money. And, uh, and so... But, but, okay. but the way it was looking for you, if I get this right, is you were losing money anyway. So the trial and error was actually already trying to stop that. That's correct. So we your risk to, was almost staying with the system that you were in versus trying something new. Is that yeah, accurate? It, that, that's accurate. Okay. Uh, and, and the same thing that you saw from in the film from Gabe and, and from Neil. Mm -hmm. You know, very similar type experiences. And, uh, and it wasn't that any of us were bad at what we were doing. You know, it, it, on a conventional or commodity basis. It's mm -hmm. just simply the nature of the beast. Yeah. And That's an important point. Yeah. You and I were, the idea of, of this whole project is let's learn, if we're seeing ways <laughs> to make the soil stronger, more resilient, that's what we're exploring. This isn't a game of saying someone's doing something wrong or someone's grandfather did something wrong. That's not our game at all. No. This is, this is a celebration of how do we strengthen, and we are in America, so how do we strengthen the American rancher to be more resilient, to, be, to make more money, and to be healthier and happier in their animal welfare? That's the game that we're, that we're playing. So. Well, and, and that's correct. And, and the honest truth is we sort of found ourselves trapped in in a way of thinking, in a way of production that, uh, that basically take us, took us away from day-to-day -day observation of our animals, of our plants, of our soil, and the whole environment around us. And what I mean by that is uh, when I was producing more conventionally, uh, we would spend all our summers cutting, raking, baling hay, and hauling the hay out of the fields, putting the hay up. And then we would spend all winter feeding that hay back out. And so it became this, this sort of almost vicious cycle that, you know, that's what we were focused on. You were growing hay. We were growing hay. Yeah. And we were growing the feed stuff to feed our cattle in the winter. So we literally spent almost all year with that focus in mind. And in the winter time, in the summertime, we weren't observing the cattle. We weren't observing the soil and in the pastures because we were out in the hay fields. And then in the wintertime, we weren't observing much because we were so intent, we had to feed all the different groups of cattle during the day daylight hours. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and the enjoyment actually was almost gone. Yeah, it, it became a routine and it became rigorous. And it, the enjoyment didn't come back until we shifted the way that we were doing things. And what we learned is that through sheer powers of observation, just watching the animals every day, looking at your, at your plants, at your forages, and everything else that's growing there, looking at the, the, the arthropods, the insects, the wildlife, uh, the water quality. You know, and one of the things that in the film that Gabe and Neil talked about was the fact that we have been able to significantly improve water infiltration. And so now we're capturing a lot of water that before was running off of our farms and running into streams and creeks and ponds and lakes and so forth. And when it would do that, what was it taking with it? Well, it was taking the nitrates and the phosphates and the sediment, the topsoil, all of that as well. So we've been able to significantly reduce that, but the power of observation is incredible. And that's how we've been able to make the progress that we've made, but it has also restored the joy in what we do on a day to day. And every day now, I love going out to the farm. I love discovering what's new. What's the new plant mm -hmm. growing now that wasn't there last year or even the week before? Well, let's talk about that. Yeah. There's a thing called the latent seed bank. It's literally seeds that are in the soil 
that have said for 100 years, basically, screw you, I'm not going to grow because you're not treating me right. And until folks start treating these seeds right, they don't grow, but they're there. So you're seeing seeds, you're seeing plants grow that weren't seen in your county in 100 years, is that accurate? Actually, we have, uh, we have species that you didn't today. plant. That we didn't plant, yeah. right. What we did was the, the farm that was in the film, uh, when it was purchased, uh, it, and it was purchased because it, it adjoined another farm uh, that my partner and I had, so, uh, so it made sort of a contiguous area. But it was in terrible condition. All grown up in weeds and brush and bramble, and you know, in Mississippi, everything grows. Okay, so everything was there, and not much of it was good. And uh, and and we had no more than three to four documented forage species there, as, along with all the other junk. Uh, so when we went in, we decided that we were going to use the livestock as our tool rather than chemicals and mechanical methods and that type of thing. We were going to use the livestock. And so we went in with uh, high stock density, short duration grazing, specifically with the intent to build soil organic matter and tap into the latent seed bank. Yes, sir. Let me just uh, open it up. We're going to open it up to questions because we need to get the mic to you so the folks online can hear that. But the question was, did we ever switch to longhorns? We can talk about that, but we'll get it going. Yep. So back to the latent seed bank. Okay. Yep. Well, what we were doing is uh, we wanted, we knew from, from other examples around the country that with the right type of livestock impact, they could actually tap into that latent seed bank, stimulate or scarify those seeds to germinate and grow. And then with the high stock density, short duration grazing, where we allowed long rest periods, then those newly germinated seeds could come up and have time to establish themselves, to establish a, a, a strong root system and thrive. What often happens with conventional grazing is that because the cattle return again and again to the exact same spot, even if they do happen to tap into the latent seed bank, that seed cannot establish itself, okay? Because they're gonna bite off that new growth because it's tender and young and tasty and literally pull it up by the root and it's gone. So it doesn't have time to establish. But now, remember I said that we started with no more than three to four uh, documented forage species. We have over three dozen now and none of them were planted. And we've had NRCS personnel and extension personnel from Mississippi State come out and document the different species that are there now. And they've asked us, when did you plant this or this or this? We didn't. And they said, no, wait a minute. We haven't seen, some of these species haven't been documented in this area for more than 200 years. Whoa. Yeah. So, so th another thing that's happening at, at, your, uh, at your ranch in Starkville that I think is fascinating is the insects are coming back. You're getting a great diversity of insects. Then you're getting a great diversity of birds. Right. You're getting a great diversity <laughs> of wildlife. And all of a sudden, your spot is the spot for hunters. And, and, and they're making money by selling rights to hunt on their land. They actually have a, a, you have a hunting lodge. So it's a whole new income stream for you. And the thing that I like, I know I'm talking for you here, but um, the hunters are now the stewards of your land. Correct. Talk about that. That blows my mind. Well, it's, uh, and, and actually there's a little more story behind that, but uh, there, there, there's a little company called Mossy Oak. Uh, that many of you have probably heard of, the camo company, that, uh, that actually owned that same piece of property. They bought it as a hunting property. Okay? But, but the hunting wasn't very good they, as it existed in that state. Okay? And they had planted food plots and all of this, but they still weren't pleased with the amount of wildlife on the property and so forth. So that's the reason it was up for sale. Uh, in, in five years of owning the property, uh, we have increased the wildlife population so significantly that they have offered to buy it back. But, uh, but actually, you know, what happened is that the, the wildlife population from the white-tailed deer to wild turkey to grassland birds like quail and so forth uh, to small game species so forth have just exploded. 
And in conjunction with that, we have seen an explosion in the insect population, uh, particularly in pollinator insects. We're seeing pollinator insects there now that we haven't seen for, for many, many years. And they're everywhere. They're, they're just all over the place. Uh, we see earthworms everywhere now. Uh, even in the middle of fields on a hot summer day, we can dig down and, and find earthworms. Because it's cool. Because it's cool because we ground. leave yeah. cover. We, we don't take it down to the bare ground. We protect it, keep the soil moist and cool. Uh, and we routinely monitor our soil microbial life as well. So what I call our wildlife beneath the soil. Yeah, and, uh, and they are thriving. Yeah, and, and that is that population has exploded as well. Now, the question I get almost every day when I'm out talking about this is, why isn't this being done everywhere? And are your neighbors still calling you crazy? You know, let's, yeah. let's talk about that perception piece. They are calling you crazy, so we have the answer there. Okay. <laughs> it, in agriculture particularly, and, and it's probably, this is just human nature, but, but in agriculture we're really tough in this regard is that we're traditionalist. You know, we grew up that way, we were taught that way, we were trained that way, and, uh, and I was too. Uh, but so effecting change in agriculture, when you look at every major change that has occurred here in the U.S. in ag, it has typically been somewhere between a 25 and 30 plus year cycle to effect any major change. Okay. And one of the key reasons that people are slow to change, again, you've got to remember this is our livelihood. Okay. So they're afraid. They're, if, if I make these changes, how is this going to impact my bottom line, you know, the revenue that I'm generating and my profit? And so it scares them to make any kind of wholesale change. I think that's reasonable. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so... <coughs> Just like in anything else you do, you have the very small percentage of people that are the, the pioneers and the innovators, right? That actually jump out and do the trial and error and, and fail and succeed and fail and succeed and so forth. And then you have those that are the early adopters. And then you have those that are watching the innovators and the early adopters and waiting mm -hmm. to see what happens with them. And then you have those that are what I call just the out-and-out -out scoffers. <laughs> you, know, that, ah, you know, you're all nuts. What in the heck are you doing? Uh, and so you start with less than 1%, mm -hmm. and they want to observe, and then you grow to 5%, 10%, 20%. Now, when you get to 20%, that's the critical mass. That's when you can start making very rapid change. And, and I can tell you this, that you know, I, I speak at a lot of conferences and so forth around the country, and um, 10 years ago, we would not have had a room of even this many farmers and ranchers uh, as the number that we have of folks here today to talk about soil health, to talk about the things that we're talking about today. Now, we're speaking at conferences where we have thousands of farmers and ranchers. So they are interested. They do want to learn. Yeah, we, we, met, at the, uh, we met up at the GrassFed Exchange. They had a conference last year, and they're going to have one in, uh, in uh, Columbia, Missouri this summer. And there was about five, 600 people mm -hmm. at the conference. And I thought everyone there was going to be people who were practicing these methods of ranching. But it was mostly people who hadn't done it yet. And I thought that was very encouraging. So. We're talking about a way of, of using cattle as a tool to turn on the soil and get land to a very healthy state. Um, the end product for a lot of people would be a grass-finished steak. Mm -hmm. My vegan friends get caught up in that piece. And I say, you want cattle on your land, if you're growing food, whether you're going to eat the cattle or not. W what do you say about that? Because that's what I say, and I'm asking you now. Well. What I'll say is that, first of all, the fertility of many of the Great Plains globally, not just in the U.S. and Canada, but, but globally, that fertility was built from the action of 
enormous herds of large ruminants, followed by small ruminants, followed by birds. Okay, sort of the Serengeti model. And, uh, and when we started practicing agriculture on a large scale, and particularly when we started fencing everything in, and, and animals no longer were free to roam and, and just graze wherever, you know, like the bison in the U.S. were. Meaning Still in packs, but moving right, on their own. Right. Predators chasing them. Pred you know, I if you look at the way that, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about bison here, or we're talking about wildebeest, or, you know, or any large ruminant around the world, you know, they, they were obviously impacted by the action of predators. So that kept them, you know, for sheer protection mechanism congregated or mobbed up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they were grazing forward continuously. You know, because in, they didn't know that they were, you know, improving the land. This was just what they were doing. But that's what built the great fertility and the tremendous depth of soil organic matter through centuries and centuries of that type of impact. Uh, and we found that, you know, with a, unfortunately, when we started plowing all this up and everything, we, we started losing a lot of that carbon, sequestered carbon. We started losing a lot of our organic matter, and uh, you know, most of you have probably seen the figures today that you know, we're averaging around 75 billion tons annually of global soil loss, you know, and over 7 billion tons in the U.S. alone. Uh, let, and me, let me wedge into that yeah. one. I was in Ames, Iowa at Iowa State, and uh, was speaking with some folks from the USDA. They said for every pound of corn grown in Iowa, they lose a pound of soil. And I see some friends who know this nodding their head. So just for the folks at home. Okay. Yep. Well, and we, we did some research in, in Wisconsin along those same lines with the University of Wisconsin and, uh, and NRCS and other entities. And, and we found that the average row crop farming operation in Wisconsin is losing right at three tons of soil per acre annually. And the average dairy cropping system, and we're talking about a conventional dairy operation, is losing... Uh, about 1.8 tons uh, of soil, topsoil per, per acre annually. And that's like an income engine that they're, they've reversed. So it's an out, outgoing. Well, if you put it on economic terms, for every 1% soil organic matter uh, per acre, that's $750 worth of nutrients. Okay? So, so if you have 5% organic matter, you know, that's over $3,700 worth of nutrients per acre. Now, if you're losing that, uh, it's actually costing U.S. farmers more than $20 billion annually to replace those lost nutrients from that topsoil loss. When it could be happening naturally, they right. could be saving money and be more resilient. So there's a lot of logic here that's just, is it, I, I just think of it as just new. You know, it's obviously old systems, but it's new ways of letting nature kind of be a, you know, dancing with nature as, 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 as Gabe Brown says in the movie. You know, he's not as stressed when he's working with nature as he was fighting nature. It's and so old, it's new. And like I tell a lot of people, if, if, if you're old enough to remember the Barbara Mandrell song, I was country when country wasn't cool, <laughs> you know, that's what we are now. You know, uh, so, so it's, we're, you know, there's very little that's new in this world. All we're doing is we're reaching back and finding ways and, and sort of, you know, retooling or retailoring some of the thing, practices that were used centuries ago. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. In five years on our farm uh, of using these grazing methods, we built soil organic matter from 1.2% to 4.5% now in five years. Okay? Gabe Brown, you know, you heard what he, he talked about in the film. You know, they have gone from less than 2% soil organic matter to over 6%, and from less than a half inch water infiltration rate per hour to over eight inches water infiltration rate per hour. You know, folks, those changes in a very short period of time are astounding. And to be honest with you, you know, and again, from an academic standpoint, if, if I think about this as a scientist, it's actually hard for me to wrap my mind around that because we've believed for a long time that those kind of changes would take centuries. Yeah. And we're seeing them 
in years, <coughs> a few years. Yeah, I mean, tell me something you probably learned in school. Let me know if I'm right. It takes a thousand years to build an inch of topsoil. Right. That was something you were taught, right? We and sure then, were. And then what I'm saying is maybe if you're a glacier, it'll take you that long. But if you're Neil Dennis, it's taken him about a decade exactly. or even less. Exactly. Because on Neil's ranch, you can dig a hole in the ground. He could say, you know, four years ago, I put a whole bunch of hay down. You can see that hay in the layer, and then you can see the soil on top of it. Um, why don't we open it up for questions now? There's so much I want to talk about. Um, and, and, and Susan, let's... Oh, hold on one sec. Let's get the mic to you. Hi. I, I'm, I'm going to actually just ask a quickie and then the real question. One, do you work with Brent Bailey, 25 by 25? No. He's based in Jackson, so okay. later I, okay. I'll connect you guys. Yeah, He'd right. love to talk to you. Um, my question is actually buttons on to what you guys were just talking about, soil development. And I'm an anthropologist, and archaeologists recognize that human beings actually create a lot of dirt. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if there is some cross-disciplinary research that could be applied here, because I would say that we usually be estimate that people are creating some type of dirt at more like a rate of about half an inch every 50 years or so. I mean, because you can see like London and Paris, where they were in medieval times, yeah. it's like 12 or 13 feet, you know, 600 years ago, you know, do the math because I'm per not good at it because I'm a cultural anthropologist. <laughs> 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 but is there something that you might want to look at? Would that be helpful to you looking at other disciplines maybe or some cross-disciplinary? Well, I think that would be great. Yeah, I would, I would love to, to take a look at that. Well, human behavior is a big piece of this. Yes, it is. Because if we want to scale, how can we scale fast if we don't have ranchers speaking to ranchers, trusted voices speaking to trusted voices, and you know this. How are you going to do that? You're going to get ranchers to do that. And, and so it's a huge piece of this. The natural sciences piece of this. Mm -hmm. And the human sciences piece of this. Social sciences piece of this. Huge. Any other questions? Okay, we've got some in the back. Hi. Um, I'm a PhD student at Washington State University, Julian Reyes. Um, I love the video, by the way. I love the little precipitation gauge by each of the three people. I think that was great. Um, anyways, um, how do you reconcile this method with what's happening in the Intermountain West, where is a, the, the invasive annual grass, cheatgrass, right? And so there's that vicious cycle where, where there's more soil disturbance, there's actually more cheatgrass. And so I was just wondering if you've looked at this method in that area and or um, farmers found that this method works in the Intermountain West, for example? Yeah, actually, uh, and, and that's a very good question, um, but actually we have quite a few clients in the Intermountain West uh, and then uh, going on down into Nevada and Utah and New Mexico, Arizona, and so forth. Uh, so you're absolutely right. However, again, it all has to do with the, gra the specific grazing methodology, okay? Uh, what we have found is that we can accomplish the exact same things that we've accomplished, whether it's in Mississippi, whether it's in Saskatchewan, or, or in North Dakota, as was shown in the film, uh, but in the Intermountain West, and even in the more arid regions. We've done a lot of work in, uh, in, in, the, in northern Mexico, in, in the Sierra Madre Range, and so forth, with a lot of ranches there. And what we have found is that, again, using high stock density, short duration impact, and longer rest periods that, you know, it, what it boils down to with the cheatgrass is it's all about competition. If the cheatgrass is given a chance to outcompete anything else, it will. But if you use the livestock appropriately, <coughs> then the cheatgrass is just a small part of what's growing there and many other species that are in that latent seed bank will come up and actually outcompete the cheatgrass. Because yeah. they're the native species to that ecosystem. It, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Got one more back there, and then we've got one in the red. Hi, so I have a quick question about, um, this is a really cool method of, of new kind of ranching, but with the system of production, the scales of production that we have today with concentrated animal feed operations and intensive livestock operations, do you see this as a way of scaling out of those systems, mm -hmm. or are there elements of this ranching system that can be adopted by CAFOs and ILOs to sort of replace them or to modify them? Or, yeah, how do you see supplying beef to the American appetite over a long-term situation? I'm going to add on to that question. Can we feed the world doing this? Okay. First of all, um, we have, 
we have studied very intently the amount of grassland acres that are, that are available in the U.S. Uh, if you look at a well-run, grass-fed, grass-finished system, okay, it takes about eight-tenths of an acre to finish a steer. Just during, now that's during the finishing phase. Okay? So you've got the cow-calf phase and all of that. And so we're not talking about taking acreage away from cow-calf operations. Okay? We're talking about grassland acres that are available to finish a steer or a heifer to harvest weight. So it takes, on the average, on well-run operations, about eight-tenths of an acre. In the U.S., we have enough available grassland right now that is not you know, encumbered in any other manner that we could finish over 35 million head annually on grass alone. Now, if you look at the number of fed cattle coming out of feedlots right now, it's only about 26 million. So we can, right now, we have the capacity in the U.S. in grassland to actually finish more cattle than we're currently finishing in the feedlot situation. Now, to the second part of your question, are there ways to be able to integrate and to, and to make maybe the, the concentrated animal feeding operations better, more efficient, reduce issues with runoff waste and so forth? Yes, um, we, can, we can certainly keep a lot more cattle on grass a lot longer. That will cheapen the cost of gain number one, and graze properly, we're providing tremendous benefit, like we saw in the film, to our land, and we're able to more effectively use the feedlots, because now they become basically much shorter term finishing operations. Yeah. Um, and what was the... The other one was, can we feed the world, and then I'm going to wedge in on, on the whole idea of cattle on grass for a longer period okay. of time. Uh, one, in, one more point I guess I want to make about that. Uh, at last year's grass-fed exchange conference, Bill Helming, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bill Helming, but he is uh, the former NCBA, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, chief economist, and was also the founder and former CEO of Cattlefax, which is, for any of you that are economists, you, you'll definitely recognize Cattlefax. That's the leading uh, you know, leading entity out there for, for economic and financial information in the cattle industry. But, uh, so Bill has been heavily tuned to all of this for his entire career. And at the Grass-Fed Exchange Conference last year, he made the direct statement that we must move. He, he said, right now the U.S. beef industry is a one-trick pony, and it's to our detriment. And we must make some varying moves within the industry to be able to, first of all, satisfy the growing consumer demand for different types of beef products. Okay? So what he said was he's projecting that within five to ten years, the grass-fed sector will become 40 percent of the entire U.S. beef production. What is it now? Right now it is about six percent. It's that big. It's that big now. Yeah, okay. believe it or not, which is significantly more than it was 10 years ago. And you're saying that 20% inflection points, what you're it, aiming for. For the last 10 years, the grass-fed sector has, been, has had an annual growth rate of 25 to 30%, mm -hmm. you know, which far surpasses the growth rate of any other protein product in the U.S. at this point in time. Uh, but Don Close, uh, who is chief analyst and vice president for Rabobank, also just recently put out an article a couple of months ago where he agreed with Bill Helming's assessment. You know, so we now have commodity, commodity industry economists that are saying, yes, we are moving more and more towards more grass-fed beef production in the U.S. And even in the feedlot sector, because of the higher grain prices, cost of gain and all that, we have certainly seen feeder cattle stay on grass longer before they enter into the feedlot sector. Now, can we feed the world using this methodology? My answer is yes and more so, because this is truly sustainable. This builds soil. When you want a, when you want a definition of sustainable, in my mind, it's not maintaining status quo. It's building. 
you've seen, you've seen what we've done, okay? If you can build soil organic matter, if you can improve water infiltration, if you can build soil microbial populations and reduce your reliance on all of these inputs, like Gabe and, and us and Neil and many others have done, then absolutely we can feed the world doing this and we can feed the world better because we'll have better land, more land that is arable and available for growing crops, particularly if we start back into livestock <coughs> crop rotations. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the keys, you know, is instead of having land continuously in row crops, let's go back to a livestock row crop rotation mentality build that land, give it rest from the row crops, and I think if we do that, we are absolutely creating the foundation of being able to feed that, what, nine million plus projected by 2050. A couple of things, I uh, want to talk about animal welfare, and I also want to talk about methane. Uh, you saw at the end of the film, we're alluding to a team of scientists that we're putting together at ASU, and, um, and so, we have one of, those, one of those team members is a guy named Jason Roundtree at Michigan State University, and he's studying the methane cycling of the animals. And um, his early data, it's early, but he's finding that in the healthy soil, in a healthy soil system, there's microbes called methanotrophs mm -hmm. that are actually taking up as much mm -hmm. methane as the animals are eructating or burping and or. And that he's thinking that the methane question is a red herring. And that's, that's what's coming up right now with, 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 with Jason. We've just got a few minutes left. I want to talk about animal welfare. Mm -hmm. And let's just talk about what's happening to the animals in the systems that you're doing and promoting, maybe even just around weaning mm -hmm. and those things. I'll let you carry this thing out. Well, I'll tell you right now, we've changed every, everything that we do. Okay, we have completely changed it. You know, used to, when we weaned calves, we weaned them at the typical recommended weaning age, you know, six months to seven months. And, uh, and, and on weaning day, we would gather the herd up, you know, we would vaccinate the calves, castrate, dehorn, whatever had to be done to the calves, deworm them, all of this, you know, run them through the chute to do all of this, and then take them away from their mothers, you know? So they were, they were highly stressed. They had no, you know, they're youngsters, okay? A six-month-old calf would be like a 10-year-old, okay, for, for a human. And, and so we're doing all of this and stressing them, yanking them away from their mothers. And so over the next few days, what do they do? They're, they're cooped up in this lot because if you turn them out in the pasture, then they're going to run all over the place because they're naive. They don't know what to do without their mothers, okay? And so you could have calves running through fences and getting out. So you keep them up in the corrals. And, and because they're cooped up and they're bawling, they're not eating or drinking very much, they've been highly stressed. You're then, asking them to eat hay when they've never done it before. Right. They, they don't know how to necessarily drink out of those trawls and those corrals or eat what you supplied them in the corrals because they've always been with their mothers and doing in nursing from their mothers and nibbling forage here and there. So they're very naive, I guess is the best way to describe them. And so oftentimes we get a lot of what we call breaks, which means that an outbreak of, of respiratory illness and things like that, and so you have to use a lot of antibiotics and so forth to treat these calves. What we have done is we now have moved to we our calves stay on their mothers till they're nine to ten months of age, okay? Now, and they're not separated from their mothers until then. Now, a calf that is six months of age, remember we said that's like a 10 to 12 year old, okay? A calf that is nine to 10 months of age, guess what? Now you've got an 18 to 20 year old, all right? And you have 18 to 20 year olds that you're ready to kick out of the house, right? Hmm. You know, that you're, you're deemed them ready. Go to college, go to work, whatever, get out of here. Those calves are the same way. They're no longer naive. They have had those extra months to learn from their mothers. They are now grown up, so to speak. So they know how to forage. They, they know, know how to forage. They've, learned, they've had more opportunity to learn behavior from their mothers. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're easier to work with. They don't get sick. They're almost naturally weaned. 
because their mother's natural milk production is already tailed off so much that they, the only thing they're really relying on their mothers for at that point is companionship and not nursing. Okay? So it's a natural weaning process. The calves simply do not get sick. We don't have to get them up and confine them in our pens or corrals anymore. All we have to do is just fence line separate them from their mothers. They'll look at their mothers a day or two, maybe walk up to the fence line where they can nuzzle noses. And then it's like, okay, mom, see ya. I'm on my own now. And it's that simple, that easy. And we have eliminated our health problems. You know, we don't need antibiotics anymore. You know, it's very rare that we actually have a sick animal now. And that's wonderful. So that's one system you've adjusted. It's three more months with the animal. Yeah with its mom, you're taking all that stress out right? so those stress hormones don't get produced and, and the, the medicine that you need to feed the animals goes down a lot or almost all. And, and here's the other thing, they actually perform better for the rest of their lives. Okay? Perform better, you mean they get fatter better? They'll, they'll fatten quicker, they'll, they'll gain better, again they're not sick. Uh, a lot of times what happens is when these calves get sick at weaning from respiratory disease and they have to be treated, they have permanent scarring in their lungs and that can affect them later on in life okay, and cause them to get sick again and again. With these calves, they just simp they stay very healthy their entire lives and because they have learned that, they have l had longer to learn that grazing behavior from their mothers and what plants to eat and all of this type of thing, when they're on their own, they just blow and go. In, in the calves that we weaned in the old method, they actually lost weight you know, for a month or so after weaning and then had to gain that back and then move forward. So, so the calves under this new way of doing things are actually far ahead in their development of the others. Using nature as signals, using natural signals the whole way through. And we have far fewer inputs, both mm -hmm. in pharmaceuticals and in feed, supplemental feed cost, so they are actually cheaper for us to produce. Therefore, you make more money. Absolutely. Which, to me, is a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. So is there any other questions? We're going to wrap it up. We're going to end it on the rancher making more money no note. Right? All right. Well, Alan, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. You bet.